Before the video begins, I'd like you all to do me a massive favor. My buddy is making some amazing true crime content on his channel, The Disturbing Truth. The cases he covers are some of the rawest, hardest hitting true crime horror stories I've ever heard. If that's your kind of thing, please subscribe to The Disturbing Truth by clicking the top link in the description or the link in my pinned comment below. But let me warn you, this content will leave you seriously unsettled. Bring a strong stomach, and let's give The Disturbing Truth some support. I was a fresh-faced graduate from high school. The summer before I left for UT, I took a construction job. I had a full scholarship for my first two years, but having a full wallet would help pay for the small things. Most of the other guys were friendly and entertaining. A day didn't pass where we weren't doubled over in laughter because of something someone did or said. Two of the guys were exceptionally funny. Mark and Daniel had been working on separate sites or together for the past 15 years. They were both grade A practical jokers, but sometimes Mark would take things a little too far. Daniel was more than often the target of his humor. This would become a source of tension between the two, but they always made up by the end of the workday. As you may expect, eventually Mark's joking would go too far for Daniel to overlook. That day just happened to be on my final week on the job. For some time, everyone on the site had noticed Daniel wasn't himself. He spent long periods of time somewhere talking on his phone. When he wasn't gone, he seemed constantly agitated. His usual happy-go-lucky manner had disappeared. We'd all tried our best to make him laugh, but nothing had worked. Not even Mark could do it. As time went on, we all began to believe his troubles were about his girlfriend. When Mark heard about this, he couldn't stop himself from poking at the sore spot. On this day, Daniel had gone on the phone... And when he came back, Mark started joking around. What's wrong, Danny boy? Are you having troubles at home? Is your old lady getting the bone from the mailman? The verbal jabs only served to annoy Daniel even further. He said nothing. Instead, he just stared at Mark like he was going to burn through him with his eyes. Mark wasn't going to let his bad mood get in the way of getting a laugh. After lunch and throughout the rest of the day, Mark continued on with his jokes. Daniel, a guy who usually said something when he was fed up, held his tongue the whole day. I knew if he didn't put a stop to Mark's poking, he would take things too far and cause a problem. Maybe even a fight, I thought. Daniel was clearly not in any mood to let the remarks roll off his back. And as quitting time arrived, I relaxed. I was almost sure Mark would let up. Unfortunately, things only got worse. A lot worse. It was quitting time. We were going around the site picking up our tools and cleaning any trash we'd left behind. Everyone was focused on the task at hand. I was off in my own little world, thinking about any last minute things I needed to do before I left for school. When everything was complete, we were all standing around discussing our plans for the forthcoming weekend. It had been a while since Mark had made any jokes and I assumed he'd stop for the day. When his turn came, he looked very serious and said, well, I think since old Danny's going fishing, I'll go over to his place and give his old lady some boning. The joke had come by complete surprise to all of us, and we all fell over ourselves laughing. All but Daniel, of course. I saw a snarl appear across his face. His teeth were gritted so tightly it looked like they'd crumble any second. I'm so sick of your stupid jokes! No sooner had he said this, Daniel stepped forward with his hammer drawn back. I was precariously close to Mark at the time. I stumbled back so quickly I fell onto my butt. I looked up just as Daniel brought the claw end of the hammer into Mark's skull. Mark immediately fell over seizing. Writhing around the floor I was in shock and I froze where I was. I watched Daniel for his next move. He stood over Mark's convulsing body for a moment, surveying his handiwork, I suppose. I was relieved when he calmly walked over to a bench and just sat down. 
I don't think I could have moved had he come at me. Just like me, the other guys were frozen in place watching as Mark's body slowly came to a limp halt. And we all looked at each other, too terrified to speak. Daniel broke the silence for us. I guess... I guess y'all should call the cops. I'm not gonna run off or anything, I'm just... just a little fed up. The resignation in his voice showed just how far gone he was. The old Daniel I knew wouldn't have done anything like this. We did like he asked and he didn't give the cops any trouble when it came time to take him away. I thought the shock was affecting me at that moment, but even now, I don't feel anything but sorry for Daniel. It would come out later just how bad things had been going on at home. His girlfriend at the time had cheated on him more than once. She had blamed it all on him and he had been working two, sometimes three jobs just to keep her happy and keep up with expenses. He was neck deep in love and too blind to realize what was happening until it already had happened. After all he did to give her what she wanted, she had the nerve to complain about him being gone so much. When he was at work, all he could think about was, is she with another guy right now? He was too private to share any of this with us. I don't think Mark had any idea what was truly occurring. He took a shot, and when he saw that he'd hit a nerve, he rode it into the ground. And he did that a lot, and I suppose this turned out to be one too many. I'm sometimes still in shock when I sit back and think about how quickly his life left his body, even in those last few convulsing moments. All of us offered to serve as character witnesses, but it turned out not to be necessary. A deal was struck and Daniel agreed to serve 15 years. He's been offered parole in the intervening years, but decline it. With his release date soon approaching, I hope he's able to get his life back together and move beyond the shadow of this crime of passion, I suppose you could say. I've saved the most important person in the story for last. Mark's story obviously ended on that job site. Some readers may wonder why Daniel had received so much sympathy and Mark so little. Well, the truth is, although he was a really funny guy, that was about all he had going for him. I said already how far he would push Daniel with his joking. Heck, some folks may call it bullying these days, and I'd say they'd be right. He didn't do that to just Daniel. Not one of us evaded his comedic jabs. And that was far from his worst trait, though. Even around a bunch of East Texas rednecks, Mark's racism was off-putting. Like with his jokes, not a single culture was off-limits, and he wasn't afraid to say it. I won't even get into his views on women. I'll just sum it up by saying Mark was not a good person. Funny people tend to get away with things us other folks can't. However, even when you're making people laugh, there's a line and, unfortunately for Mark, he crossed it. One time. Too many. I probably don't have to tell you that kids aren't always the kindest of people. When you're growing up, you are learning wrong and right in real time. Kids often do and say things grown-ups would scoff at. Some things you could call cruel. And none of us reached adulthood without being guilty of these misdemeanors either. Not even me. Some may reach the end of the story and find me guilty of being one of the worst. And I'm willing to suffer that fate. I may even agree with you. After all, when I was 12, I helped kill a man. Once I reached the age of 14, I passed in the world of Latchkey Kid, a phenomenon I'm not even sure exists anymore. However, for a few years prior to that, I was forced to spend my time out of school at a local large-scale daycare center. I know my folks had no other choice at the time, but the experience was bristling, especially in the summers. I had been free to run unattended since birth. I still don't look back favorably on that time, and my feelings about being stuck in daycare is another story for another time. You're here to hear about my crime. Well, during the summers, the daycare had to find a way to keep hundreds of kids, 
some, almost as old as 16, busy. Since the center happened to be located near the downtown area, they used this to their advantage. Several attractions were within walking distance. The most often visited and my favorite was the city library. At least once a month we'd be grouped together and march the quarter of a mile or so to the place. On the walk there, the group would pass places like the old post office and several large churches. One of these churches had a spire that was easily 50 to 75 feet in the air. I'm not sure the exact height, but to the child's eyes, it might as well have been a thousand feet. Suffice to say, you wouldn't want to fall from the top of it. One particular day, our group was marching to the library and had stopped across from the church. Someone had noticed a man working at the very top of the spire. I couldn't tell you what he was doing, but to us, he was a prime target for our harassment. I have no idea who said it first, but once the initial call for fall down, fall down was heard, most of the other boys joined in. It's not a thing I say with any pride, but it's what happened. The ghoulish chant went on for another few seconds until our monitor told us to shut up. Unfortunately, her demands came too late. No more had the yells ceased than a snapping was heard. The snapping was quickly followed by the horrible sight of the following man. Everyone had seen it happen. Fortunately, his body landed on the opposite side of the building and our young eyes were prevented from seeing his ultimate demise. As you can guess, the incident caused quite a stir. Several of the girls began screaming and crying. I was in total shock for my part. The lady did all she could do and rushed us back to the daycare. I don't recall much discussion upon our return. The girls were comforted and us boys. We may have mumbled a bit about it to our friends, but no one seemed to want to relive it. These days, I'm sure droves of psychologists and counselors would have been called in to make us talk about it incessantly. This was the 80s, though. People dealt with trauma in much different ways. Whether you agree or not, that was the way things were. Around the center, the incident was quickly forgotten. Although a kid would bring it up from time to time, most of us, especially those who witnessed it, just wanted to forget. I still have no idea if my parents were notified about it. The last thing I wanted to do was bring it up to them. I like to act as if terrible things never happened, and it's worked for me so far, and let's hope it continues to. The poor man who died that day, I have no idea what unfolded afterwards. I assume that he was some sort of construction worker looking back, seeing that he was sort of on some type of scaffolding at the time and was probably just doing some basic maintenance. The adults shielded us from any severe details beyond that, and I can't say I blame them. I tried to find as much information in the intervening years, but didn't find much. It's probably for the best. I'm sure his loved ones don't want to remember him by his manner of death. This may be the first time I've actually mentioned it to anybody who wasn't there that day. And I'm sure you're wondering the same thing I am. Did our yelling actually cause that poor man's death? That question will never be answered. I remember the sound of a snapping rope, but that may be a coping mechanism. It's probably our jeering that caused him to become distracted and led to his horrible fall. A mistake on sight. I like to think that he never even heard us, and circumstances were what they were. Does that remove that last bit of nagging doubt from my mind? I'll let you figure that last one out for yourself. I know I'm not the only person to suffer from the financial collapse of 2008. It was far from a 1929 crash, but it did plenty of damage nonetheless. I've been working in the housing finance sector for almost 15 years when it happened. Once it became clear that there were going to be a lot of changes in the regulations, I was one of the first in my company to be let go. I don't blame the bosses. In a time so beset with uncertainty, your corporation's finances should be a primary consideration. I figured finding a job wouldn't take long. Week after week, I sent out resumes and contacted friends in the industry. I kept getting the same answer. Sorry, we can't take on new people until we know where things are headed. It wasn't the reply I was hoping for, but I understood. 
After a few months passed, I realized I was going to have to find a new line of work. I took a chance and called an old boss I'd had in college. Just after high school and all through college, I'd supported myself in the building trades. It had been a long time and I wasn't even sure if he'd remember me. He told me if I ever needed a job, he'd hire me back. The gamble paid off. He did remember me and promised to keep me on as long as I needed the work. It came just in time too. Although my wife and I were still renting, I knew she had her heart set on buying her own place. Oh yeah, we also had a child on the way. So, I guess you can see the urgency. It took a few weeks to get the hang of things again. The industry had evolved greatly in the time I'd been away, but I eventually caught up. Things were going well until the morning myself and another guy were sent to repair the siding of a huge three-story house in the historical district. A massive renovation was underway, and the painters couldn't start working on the outside until we finished our part. The scaffolding was already up when we arrived. I could tell from my first step the thing was thrown together fast. I gave it a quick shake and nothing fell off, so I gave it a pass. I'd been on some rickety setups before and this was solid by comparison. There was no time to be timid. We were on the clock and it had to be done yesterday. I ignored my concerns and we got to work. We started at the very top and had been there about 20 minutes when everything went to chaos. First came a high-pitched ping followed by two quick snaps. As I looked to my left, I watched my coworker drop the roughly 40 feet to earth. As he fell, planks of wood and poles fell upon him. It all seemed to go in slow motion from then on, and I knew that I was next. For some stupid reason, I reached out and tried to grab the siding before me. I watched long scratches appear on the cedar as the scaffolding dropped below. I tensed up and prepared for my landing. When it did finally come, I believed that I lost consciousness for a few seconds. I felt like I'd been hit by a truck and I can only imagine the other guy felt even worse. The whole rig, including myself, ended up crashing down upon him. We'd been taken away in separate ambulances and understandably, I was focused on my own condition. My back turned out to be the worst of my injuries. I'll be brief and just say it had been broken in several places, and very badly. If you think I got off the worse, you'd be dead wrong. My coworker had major internal injuries to go along with his broken bones. While both of us would spend another week in the hospital, I'm of the opinion he will suffer the most in the long term. Our boss had been there along with our families the whole time. He'd made it crystal clear that everything would be handled by him. It was a relief to hear, but the least he could do. The oddest part to that week was the near panic he was in. This was a man who'd seen it all. He'd fought in Vietnam neck deep in some of the heaviest fighting. Nothing would ever shake him. Once he watched a guy shoot himself in the hand with a pneumatic nail gun and didn't even blink. Almost every time I saw him that week he came across more shaken than even my wife. And believe me, my wife was a blubbering mess. I assumed he was overly upset because he'd known me for so long. Only later did the whole truth come out. I just happened to be speaking with my injured coworker, and he revealed a very important detail. The topic of suing our boss came up. I had no reason to file suit against the man. He'd been a good friend and a boss for many years, not to mention he'd taken care of anything we'd needed. My coworker brought up something I've never even considered. Who had set up the scaffold? I was the one who decided to climb the junkie thing after all. I wasn't looking to blame anyone and it turned out that he had spoken to one of the men responsible just days prior. The guy had said that scaffolding had been missing several bolts. When he offered to go back to the warehouse and get some to replace them, our boss blew him off. In fact, he looked at the thing and said, It's fine. We don't have the time to worry about a few screws. I've seen worse before. Everything, the way he'd been acting, his instance in paying for everything before it had even been mentioned, it all made so much more sense. It had been four years since the accident and I was getting disability checks from the government. While not a lot of money, our family was able to get by. Had I known he'd been so negligent back then, both of us could have sued him into bankruptcy. And that was exactly why he was so panicked. He knew he'd screwed up. 
and big time. The revelation hurt me more than angered me. Some friend. He knew I would be on that scaffold. Just to save a little time and make a little more money, he neglected his worker's safety. In light of this information, I cut ties with the man. My life has been changed, definitely for the worse because of his carelessness. Just thinking of him in this moment makes me sick to my stomach. While I wouldn't call it an opportunity, I did find a place online where I can complete my education and get my accounting degree. Darn near 30 years ago, I'd been a hair away from getting it, but I took the home financing job. The money was too good to turn down. And when you're young, we don't tend to think about things in the long term. I'm able to take in work from home and the extra income has been a blessing. This past year, I was finally able to make my wife's dream come true and buy our first home. My only regret is that I'm too busted up to carry her across the threshold. All of this happened because of the negligence of one man. A man I once called a friend. I'll open up with a small bit of backstory. When I was 15 years old, my dad was transferred to a small city in Florida. It boasted a grand total of 15,000 citizens and I'll bet not a one had ever left the place. While I have grown to see the beauty of the area, a small place like that for a teenager was like waking up in a bad dream. Even before my first semester of college had begun, I was packing everything I could fit into my car and heading back across the country. It didn't take long for my old man to befriend one of our neighbors. He and Neil had both been ham radio operators when they were younger, and this new friendship had rekindled a love for the hobby in both of them. Until Neil's recent passing, the two spent most of their free time talking to one another across the airwaves. The subject of amateur radio brings us to the point of the story. At some point in the early 90s, Neil was having trouble with his coax. It's the cable that connects the outdoor antenna to your radio. Without it, you're not reaching very far. Other than a very short length outside, most of it was running through the attic down into his office. He crawled inch by inch through the attic until he discovered his problem. It appeared that a small animal had been gnawing on the cable, and Neil was livid. This variety of cable wasn't cheap. In order to prevent any future problems, he meticulously tracked down any small hole or crack in the facade of his house and sealed them up tight. As he hoped, no further problems were had. He and my dad continued sharing their interest for the hobby until Neil's death in 2016. Upon his passing, Neil's home had been left to his son. He decided to put it up on the market, and before he could, a few repairs had to be done. He found a couple of companies able to do the work and agreed on a price. He set them to their job and waited. Within a few days, he'd received a call from one of these contractors with a shocking story. While undertaking the demolition of the deck, they had discovered a square piece of wood nailed to the house. Their curiosity took over and they pried it from the facade. The board had been covering an opening to the crawl space that led under the old house. These are common on older houses without basements. When they flashed their lights under the house, they were horrified to discover the mummified body of a human. Of course, they'd call the cops right away and naturally the authorities had some questions for him. He was just as baffled as they were. The corpse had to have been there for many years, which meant the only person who may have known the truth was dead too. An in-depth investigation was launched and after one more discussion with Neil's son, a final theory was formed. This theory would mean the unfortunate victim suffered a prolonged and miserable death not many could even imagine in their darkest of nightmares. During a second discussion, one of the detectives asked Neil's son to think back on that time, to recall any strange event no matter how insignificant. Although difficult at first, something was triggered in his mind, a small but important piece of the puzzle. It was mere days after Neil had underwent his exhaustive shoring up of his home. He and his then-teenage son had left for a long-awaited skiing trip in Colorado. A week later, they returned home to a foul smell seeping in from their screened porch. Neil had attributed it to a dead squirrel or rat, perhaps trapped there after the shoring up. 
When he asked what he planned to do about the stench, Neil said, Nothing. I'm not crawling back under there. It'll fade away eventually, and we don't use that rickety old porch anyways. Forget about it. And they did just that. Neither man would ever open the door again, and the smell would fade away just as Neil had predicted. This last little fact was all the detectives needed. From what they could tell, the victim had been living in the crawl space for some time. Once Neil had sealed his exit shut, his unknown tenant was doomed. With no one around to hear his pleas for help, he quickly succumbed to dehydration, a truly horrible way to die for any man. And perhaps it was better that Neil wasn't around for the ghoulish discovery. The guilt surely would have been overwhelming. Despite the large amount of press surrounding the death, Neil's son was eventually able to sell the house and disappear quickly back into anonymity. I've heard some crazy things during my time in the trade. The following is a recounting of the most terrible and heartbreaking thing I'd ever encountered with my own eyes. This took place in 2017. I had only been apprenticing as a carpenter for a few years. Our company had just won a big contract from the city. The job was to demolish a small neighborhood of abandoned homes, some going back to the 30s and rebuild a low-income housing project in its place. My job didn't begin until all the demolition was completed and the area cleared. With nothing better to do, I drove out to the site to watch the leveling and prepping of the ground. For most of the day, my boss and I hung around and BS with the guys doing the work. I'd become good friends with several of the dudes working with me. A group of us would go out on Saturday nights to drink and have a good time. Moses, a Latino fellow about my age, turned out to have grown up not two blocks from me. For some reason, we'd never met before I got on at the company. The two of us would share stories of our childhood in the old neighborhood and we soon became good friends. Just a few weeks prior to this incident, he and his girl had asked me to move into their apartment. Their prior roommates had lost his job and had to move back home. I agreed and was in the process of packing up when this happened. Anyway, my boss and I returned after lunch. We were in the on-site office talking to the big boss. He was going over some plans with us when a loud crash came from outside and a bunch of yelling started. I looked out the window and saw several of the guys running towards something. Of course, I was curious. The three of us walked over to join the others. We were still unsure of what was going on until we got about ten yards away. Slowly, the edges of a giant hole grew larger with every step. Not until I'd reached the very precipice that I realized the full horror of what was unfolding. This huge hole was now much more. I'd heard of sinkholes, but never fully understood what they were. And that was until now. The very size of the thing had me in awe. An easy 30 yards across and at least 20 feet deep. The monstrosity had swallowed a full-size bulldozer and its driver with plenty of room to spare. And about that driver, I was afraid to ask who it was. They were nowhere to be seen and surely hadn't survived. Almost as if the others could read my mind, Moses' name began to fill the air around me. Even before the emergency services arrived, we were yelling down into the dark chasm hoping for some sign of life, no matter how small it may be. Our efforts were met by nothing but silence and the occasional crumbling sound of further collapse. There was nothing left for us to do but wait while rescue did their jobs. I'm not ashamed to say I had my fingers crossed. Up to the moment his body was lifted from the hole, I held a shred of hope. There was no way to avoid the truth now. My best friend, and a very great man, was gone. The detectives allowed me to be the only one to notify Veronica of his death. When I arrived at the apartment alone, she broke down immediately. My face surely betrayed my feelings to the entire world. Despite all my attempts at being stoic, seeing her tears burst the dam. We held each other and cried for several minutes until she eventually summoned the courage to hear my story. The repair of the sinkhole began the day after the funeral and took well over a week to complete. 
Returning to the site was difficult and I could tell I wasn't the only one having a hard go of it. Time passed and, with it, work became easier. When the guys did begin talking again, most of what was said was about Moses. You really don't know how loved a person is until they die. At least that's how I saw it. A day didn't pass where one of us didn't have a great story to recall to the others. It helped ease the sadness. I realized then just how lucky I was to call him a friend. In tragedy, something beautiful sometimes comes of it. What none of us knew at the time, including Veronica herself, was that she was pregnant. At first, all we could think of was how terrible it was that Moses wouldn't be around to see his child born. However, as I thought more about it, I realized this was truly a miracle. Had he passed a week sooner, his bloodline would have died with him. When the day arrived, I was lucky enough to be the first notified of the birth of little Moses Ramirez Jr. My greatest hope now is to live long enough to see him grow into adulthood. If he becomes half the man his father was, the world would be better for having him. He has some pretty big shoes to fill and something tells me he'll do just fine. Thank you for sharing my story and remember to hold your loved ones close. Life is far too short. Until Bird took me under his wing, I'd never been good at anything. School was a long string of average grades and fleeting friendships. My sad attempt at becoming a football hero was just that, sad. I'd hoped I could better myself by attending a nearby junior college only to fail out within two years. Somehow I was introduced to Bird and things only improved. Bird was a well-known carpenter specializing in ornate carving and design. I was just a young 20-something with no real direction in life. My job was nothing more glamorous than cleaning up after a bunch of half-stone builders around the worksite. Out of the blue, my boss came to me and said that I was being promoted. I was all excited, thinking I'd get a little cushy job like his assistant or something. Instead, I was told to report to Bird, actual name Bert, and do what I was told. Story goes, Bird got his name because his British accent was so thick everyone thought that he was saying Bird instead. He didn't seem to mind. He took it in stride much like he did everything else in life and I introduced myself to him and just got a grunt in return. He handed me a work belt weighted down with some of the finest looking tools I'd ever seen and said, These are yours now. You can pay me back whenever. Take care of them. I only give them to you once. You got any questions? Good. He cut me off before I could catch my breath. I was too intimidated to speak a word after that. For the rest of the day, I followed him around, soaking in every little morsel of information I could. That was how my apprenticeship began. Day after day, I watched Bird create some of the most amazing and beautiful works of art. It was almost a month before I was given my opportunity to actually touch a piece of wood. Looking back, it was an unsightly first attempt. But something in that grotesque image told Bird that he'd be able to make me into something resembling a craftsman. It also sparked a competitiveness inside me I'd never experienced before. I couldn't stand by while Bird created such wonderful things while my work was nothing even nearing poor. Almost all my free time was spent practicing my new art, and this quickly began to bear fruit. I could see in Bird's face that he was pleased with my progress. In a few short years, my work became almost indistinguishable from his own. The day eventually arrived when it was my time to move on. Bird smiled at me like a proud father and wished me good luck. My next few years went well. I received several major commissions. The most notable, the creation of a great staircase in our governor's family home. Speaking of family, soon after leaving Bird's tutelage, I met a beautiful girl and later married. It wasn't long until our son arrived and everything appeared golden on the surface. What I didn't know then was my wife had continued her relationship with her first husband all the way up to the arrival of our son. This little fact would eventually cast doubt on who the boy's father actually was. Fortunately, later tests would prove it to be me. Even with the arrival of this great news, it did little to calm my mind. The collapse of my marriage weighed heavy on me and I wasn't completely focused on my work. 
At the time, I was building a staircase in a city away. Instead of putting all my talents towards my work, I was often elsewhere. My second to last morning at the site, I had had an argument over the phone with my wife. We had agreed that I would be allowed to take my son for the night. However, she had changed her mind at the last minute. I did finally convince her, but the damage had been done. My mood had been ruined by her fickle power play. The only thing that would help would be seeing my son. I dry-fitted the last section of railing and ran out of the door. The rest of that evening was spent playing video games and watching movies with him. I went to bed that night happier than I'd been in a long time. The next day, I dropped my son off at his mother's and went to complete my last bit of work. The house was pandemonium when I arrived. I was unable to get any reason as to why until I spoke to the grandmother of the family. She said the night before, her youngest grandson was playing with her older brother. At some point, he leaned against the landing railing and it gave way. The boy was in serious condition and, at least presently, paralyzed from the neck down. Her every word stabbed deeper and deeper into me. She was well aware of who I was and her frown told me all I needed to know about how she felt toward me. I wasn't sure what to say so I just stared until she stomped off. I rushed to the spot I'd worked last. And just as I feared, a big hole sat in the railing, open but unbroken. The remnants laid on the floor at my feet. Something didn't make sense. When I inspected the broken pieces, the true horror of what I'd done rushed into focus. I was unable to fight the sick feeling churning up in my stomach any longer. After retching for a minute or two, I looked again. It was still the same. No glue residue, or nails, or even screws. How in the world could I have made such a foolish error? A small glimmer of hope remained, though. As I ran up the stairs, purposefully grabbing at each length of rail, looking for any weaknesses, I hoped a sign or note would greet me somewhere nearby, despite my fervent search. It wasn't to be. In a matter of a few quick moments, I'd ruined all I'd built, not to mention possibly crippled a young man for life. Looking back, I probably did everything wrong. In my defense, I was incredibly broken for my mistake. I was desperate to let the parents know this. They were less than pleased to see me when they did. Although they had yet to realize just how negligent I'd been, my very image must have represented the thing that had caused their child's present condition. I left before the hospital's security arrived to remove me, and even then, I knew it would be the last time I'd hear from these clients. In the short span of time it would take for the news to spread, I took as much work as possible. Jobs that should have taken days took far longer. My confidence had taken a big hit. The double, no, triple checking of every move I made slowed me down, but I was determined I'd never make such a terrible mistake again, at least in the little time I had left. The day I dreaded finally came just three months later. The family's demand was an unbelievable $7.5 million, an amount not even someone as celebrated as Bird himself would ever be able to pay. Although my lawyer assured me the courts rarely awarded the initial amount, even $1 million would be enough to break me. If my insurance company did settle, I'd surely lose my coverage. It didn't matter. Work had dried up just as I'd feared it would from word of mouth. And then the years passed. It's been almost 13 years since that terrible day. With no new custom work coming in, I was forced to go back to regular residential carpentry. The drop in pay was hard to deal with at first, but I got by. My insurance company did just as I feared, and they managed to get the family to settle for $375,000. A paltry amount, if you ask me. My policy was cancelled the next day, and since then I've kept my head down working six, sometimes seven days a week. My divorce became final just a week after the settlement. I've swallowed a huge amount of my pride in the preceding years. I agreed to let my son stay with his mother despite my personal feelings in the matter. Maybe the differential behavior has been some form of unconscious penance for what I did, or didn't do, rather. Now that he's become his own man, I've been seeing more of my son as of late. He's shown some interest in Finnish carpentry, carving in particular. I was leery of taking him down that road at first, maybe because of my own unresolved feelings more than anything. 
He shows a natural aptitude for the trade that not even I had in the beginning. I wish Bird was still around to teach him. I've been away from that specialty for longer than I choose to admit. I fear he may not benefit the way he would had he not been taught by a more seasoned professional. Although I voice this to him, he insists that I be the one who teach him. I suppose I owe it to him in some way. That said, I intend on moving much slower with the boy than Bird did with me. Long before he's ever allowed to have his hand at a carving, there's one important aspect of the work that I wish I paid closer attention to. A man is never infallible. No matter his talents, he is open to lapses of thought. Focus and detail are the most important skills a finished carpenter must have. In a trade where your clients may use your work thousands of times in a lifetime, it is even more important to remember this. I put myself first before my client and because of this, not one, but two young men were robbed of a promising future. This was 2015, a much simpler and happier time. No one foresaw the god-awful mess ahead of us. I had been working for myself five years and my company was just beginning to make a real profit. My first son was on the way and we were just months away from closing on our house. Life was the best it had ever been. That morning a call came in for some repair work on a section of plumbing in a basement. The details were a tad sketchy but... The client was a retired widow. I wasn't expecting her to know the intricacies of her home's plumbing. After my apprentice and I finished our first job that morning, we had enough time before lunch to see what the exact problem was. The homeowner led us down the stairs and pointed out a big puddle on the floor. We poked around for a minute and found the source of the trouble. And it was a doozy. Not only was there a leaking sink next to the washer-dryer, which in itself is no major problem. The water had nowhere to go because the drain in the floor had a blockage. The two of us took an early lunch and returned to the home afterwards. I decided to tackle the drain problem first. It would require a lot of work. However, before we did any of this, we'd have to move the buttload of boxes filling the basement. Normally, I would have told the client to move their own stuff, but there was no way this old, frail woman was going to be able to move all that stuff herself. According to her, her husband had been a major collector of World War I and World War II era military items. After his death, much of the collection had been sold. The remainder had been boxed up and moved down there by her daughter. A few hours of walking up and down the stairs followed until we got to the last dozen boxes. All that remained was a small stack against the wall. I could see the end in sight and began moving them as fast as I was able. Only two remained and I could finally start the real work. My apprentice grabbed the top box so I took the last for myself. Without a second thought I snatched it up and began to head for the stairs. Out of the corner of my eye I noticed some movement. When I looked back I got the shock of my life. A small snake was coiled up in the basement floor ready to strike. A horrifying realization set in. With a heavy heart, I slowly looked down to my arm, and just above my left wrist saw two tiny spots of blood. I knew what it meant, but I was too scared to move. When my apprentice returned, he asked what was wrong. I didn't answer. I was doing everything I could not to feel the bite. It unfortunately wasn't working. He looked down and noticed a snake. Oh man, that's a timbler rattler. Without another word, he ran upstairs to return 20 seconds later. He had a machete which I can only guess came from one of the boxes, and I watched with disbelief as he jumped to one side and brought the blade down behind the snake's head. And with the threat out of the way, he contently looked back at me and said, There we go. Now he can't bite anyone. I calmly looked at him and told him he was too late. The smug look slowly melted and he led me up the stairs to the truck. I was still in so much shock I followed him obediently like a well-trained dog. During the course of the drive he kept telling me to be calm, but I think he was more terrified than I was. We were fortunate enough to know the species of the snake. 
and this allowed the hospital to be able to start the anti-venom process right away. By now, my arm was swelling and the pain was considerable. You can probably guess I survived the bite. However, in some ways, I wish I hadn't. After several days and just as many shots, I received a bill of $115,000. Even after the insurance paid their part, I was neck deep in debt. When I was able to return to work, every cent we made went to the hospital. As a result, the company and our family's financial state had been teetering on the edge of bankruptcy ever since. I'm only thankful we managed to get out of the deal with the house. We would have been in foreclosure before the year was out. The company has been downsized to just the three of us. My wife handles the calls and appointments while myself and Chris, my loyal apprentice, do all we can to keep the ship afloat. Being deemed a necessary business, we've been allowed to continue working while so many have not. I feel terrible for those who haven't. At least half of them will never return once this mess has all ended. If it ever ends, really. Even after all our hard work, we may join them in their fate. If you're religious, put in a good word for us. You may see it as a paltry act in view of how serious our situation is, but as I have discovered... The smallest of acts in the overall flow of things can make the biggest difference. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, or send it to my email, letsreadsubmissions at gmail.com and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links down in the description. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.